This morning, I'm going to start off by asking a couple of questions, as I sometimes like to do, but I want to encourage you, do not raise your hand. As a bit of a disclaimer, it's going to start off on a, on a big note, but I really have the sense that the Lord wants to do something special this morning. Like really, and I say this every time, but I think that He does. Like we, we had that song on the board now where it says, this is our God. And I am thankful that I serve a God that is amazing, that I can expect wonderful things from, that it isn't just, oh, He's that guy or that sculpture, or that something. I'm, I'm expecting the Lord to do something special this morning if we allow it, because He's not going to force Himself on us. So the first question that you shouldn't raise your hand to is, who here really believes that there is a God? All of us are thinking, like, I, like I, I can raise my hand for that one. I'm thinking, I'm hoping. So that's an easy question. Like, I hope and I trust that most of us who are gathered here this morning believe that there is a God but also that He loves us. But now, who here believes that Christ has come to give us a life of abundance, a life of fullness? Most of us can agree, that's a good point. And then here comes why I put that disclaimer in the beginning. Who here believes that they are fully living in that purpose? Who here believes that they are fully living in what it is that God has come to die for this morning? Or do we feel that we are not exactly where we feel where we can be? And then this morning I was telling Sophia, I was actually just randomly thinking, I was thinking about the prosperity gospel, people who so adamantly believe that Jesus came and died so that we could have a good business or a beautiful spouse or a nice house. That's not why Jesus came. He came, He suffered, He died so that we could not only be saved from hell, but also that we can have a life of abundance, which means a life of purpose, which means saving people and leading people to Christ. That's why He came. And so it's a beautiful thing. But yet, for some reason, we struggle to live in that fullness. And then here comes the even more difficult question that I even had to pose to myself very roughly, if I will. Who here has sort of given up on that? Because you sort of feel to yourself like, this is the extent of my Christian growth. Like, I've done everything I can, but I think I've hit a glass ceiling. I, I, I can feel hearts and hey, and hands being raised inside. Because I think that there's more of us than I think we'd like to admit. Because we think that we've experienced greatness, we've maybe even felt God's presence, but that's sort of the plateau. And I don't care where you're at, whether you're there, there, or like just short of heaven, I believe that we have a God that can take us higher. And I feel that that's what the Lord wants to do this morning. And you're saying, Johan, that's a very, very big, statement or promise that you want to make but it's not it's just i really feel that the lord wants to take us to enough to another level of our faith to actually be able to step into that fullness of life because what happens is because we keep on failing we start giving up because of our pasts because of our families because of the lies the enemy tells us we think that this is the furthest extent of our christian walk and I feel that the Lord this morning wants to take us one step further. And I feel that a large part of that is the way that we see things, as we'll see in the moment. And we're going to do that by continuing this wonderful journey that we've been going on, on our way to David, if you will. So last week, for those of you who can remember, we spoke about Samuel and his son Saul. Or, or we spoke about Saul and his son Jonathan, where... Saul, essentially this king, he was brought up and he's king and eventually it sort of looks like he's getting the picture because he's focusing on God's people rather than himself and he gain, gains this big victory. But then last week we saw him cowering out and things sort of getting worse and worse up to the point where his son eventually steps up and says, listen, I just have this feeling of the Lord so I'm going to head out and I'm putting my life at risk for that small sense that God is going to do something. And that's sort of where we left off, where we saw Jonathan and his armor bearer taking on, I don't know, 
thousands upon thousands upon thousands of troops being willing to do that. But as the battle started, the Lord intervened, for those of you who might have missed it, and there was this confusion and people started killing each other, and it was just chaos from a worldly perspective. But from the Lord, it was just orchestrated in allowing obedience of something small to transition into something bigger. And once that started happening, that momentum started going, everyone else joined in. Because that's very often what happens. You just need that little bit of a momentum and then things start rolling. And that's sort of what we saw happening because then the whole Israelite army, including Saul and everyone jumped on the bandwagon, also wanting to be part of the victory. Because no one wants to be part of the losing. We want to be part of the victory. And that's sort of where we're continuing. But today we're going to be, first I'm going to be speaking us through and touching on certain points in one soul chapter 15, and then we're going to be reading more perfectly chapter 16. And the reason I do that is because I feel that although there's a lot to be said, I don't think that we should focus fully on this. So what happens after they join the fight? Suddenly, we start seeing Saul's true nature kick in. And everything that I'm going to be sharing at this moment, I mean with a lot of respect, because he is the Lord's anointed, but yet there's certain character traits that start kicking in that we see why he failed in many things. Because in the next chapter, we see him being very reckless. Because after they join the fight unexpectedly, he starts making proclamations and saying, now remember, this fight started. It wasn't planned from a worldly perspective. Suddenly, <gasps> there's the fight. And then after they start winning and start chasing people away, Saul makes this statement and he says, we will not eat until we win this victory. But there's no specific lines about when we're going to do this. And he just sort of, we're not eating again. And cursed be the person who eats. So this is, there's this very reckless proclamation that he makes. And also not making sure that everyone knows this, including his own son. And his son, in this whole battle and things, eventually he finds some honey. And he grabs some honey and eats some of the honey and he tastes it. And then everyone's like, what did you do? He's like, I didn't know. He didn't know. So now Saul is essentially has cursed his son with what needs to happen. So the Lord's not going to be happy because he made this proclamation for everyone but didn't tell everyone. He started getting reckless because in the beginning you saw Saul being scared and hopeless. And now he's sort of like trying to play the part. Like, okay, fine, I'll be the king. And he's starting to make orders, left, right, and center. And we see him make proclamations like that. But he doesn't make sure that everyone knows this. And then they start realizing that things are not right. And they're saying, listen, we need to figure out like why God is not happy because he's being quiet. And then they start realizing, but listen, it was because of that honey, or at least that's their perception. That's why the Lord's not happy. And then we see Saul's recklessness in 1 Samuel 14 verse 44, where Saul eventually says, yes, Jonathan, when they figured out it was him who, who ate it, you must die. Remember, this is a father saying this to his own son. You must die. May God strike me and even kill me if, I do not, if you do not die for this. Saying, yo, this is a man of faith being willing to do that. This is what I would think because he's willing to kill his son and curse himself if he doesn't follow through with what he just said the Lord will do. But then peer pr pressure kicked in. Now, I'm not saying that he should have killed his son, but because the people went in revolt, they're saying, whoa, 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 no, the Lord brought this victory. He said, okay, fine, I won't kill him. So now you see this person, he, his yes is in his yes, and his no is in his no. So now he doesn't kill his son, which we didn't want to happen, but at the one hand, you also sort of did because you need to keep your word, and you need to be more scared of God than you are of people. So now it's a sort of catch-22 situation. Nothing you do sort of feels right. But that's the type of decisions and choices that he was making at that stage that we need to see. Because he didn't really want to do it, he just wanted to act religious. He, he thought he was going to follow through, but he's more concerned about people than he is about God. But yet, for some reason, because God loves us as people and sometimes we fail, he still blesses their military um, expeditions, if you will. You see them, just very briefly, you see like they're attacking the forces on every end and everything is a victory. So this is wonderful. So Saul and his army over a period of time start attacking everyone around them, start clearing the land, if you will, and they're winning. They're wonderful. And then God uses a certain type of language, if you will, where he starts telling them, listen, speaks to 
to, to Samuel to speak to Saul. And he says, it's sort of a like, I put you in power. Now all I'm asking is this one favor, which generally isn't the way that God speaks. But this time he does. He's sort of saying like, listen, I don't want to impose you too much. I put you in power. I, I gave you everything that you sort of need and want. All I'm asking is this one thing. And this one thing isn't a car, it isn't power. It's, you see that nation over there? You need to destroy them. But not little bit. You need to utterly eradicate them. Their mothers, their children, their goats, their sheep, their everything. Everything. And we've all read these types of things and we're thinking, Yo, God, how can you be a loving God, but yet you send your own people to go kill everything? Like, how does that work? And then one day I was so thankful that I discovered this one verse where God is speaking to Abraham way back when in Genesis. And he's starting to tell him what's going to happen in the future. And then I understood God's heart better. In Genesis 15, 6, we read, this is way back when we see God speaking to Abraham. And he says, after he said, you're going to do this and that and that. He says, after four generations, your descendants will return here to this land for the sins of the Amorites do not yet warrant their destruction. Now, this isn't the same nation. I need to clarify that. that I'm, not, I'm not mistaken this. But what we do see is that what the Lord has done throughout history is there's a certain time in history where we're starting to wait for something where the Lord says, I'm going to allow them to carry on this way. And once they reach a certain level of evilness, if you will, that's it. Then everything needs to be destroyed. And we've done this when we've done previous courses and things where we've seen how God has worked in the Chinese culture. Just because we always focus on the Israelite nation and we see that biblically, doesn't mean that the Lord didn't work in different nations. It doesn't mean that he didn't work in different cultures, like he did. But we see it through this focal lens of the Israelites. So I just want to, I want to clarify that when we see the Lord saying, go kill that nation, the children, the everything, just eradicate everything there because that is the Lord saying with his utmost knowledge, there is nothing good left there. Nothing. Whatever, even the children who are, who are going to be growing up, it's, it's not going to be good. Just stop it. My judgment is coming. And the same as the judgment is coming at the end of days, it's coming. And there's a point when God does that, it's a fair judgment. It's not an emotional judgment. Oh, they don't like me. That's not what it is. So when... God says this to him, there's a reason for it. However, what does Saul do? He sends in his army, he doesn't eradicate them, he takes the king captive. And they plunder and they pillage and they take everything good that appeals to them, is, that, is how it is described in the Bible. Everything that is good and appeals to them, they keep. But everything that is bad, of bad quality, that isn't good, that they destroy. And I'm thinking to myself, like, yo, you had one job. It's a big job, but it's one job. And it's so easy for us to look at Saul and say, how can you do this? You fool. But yet at the same time, I look at my own life. And I see Jesus saving me. I see the Lord being my ultimate Savior, my God. And he tells me, listen, stop that. Remove that from your life. And yet for some reason, we don't do that. We keep the things, if I want to use the same language, that appeal to us. We are willing to give God our scraps. We are willing to give God the things that are extra, which is, by the way, one of the reasons why don't we don't send things across the pews for collection. Because very often that festers this mindset. I'm not saying all churches who do that is wrong. I'm just saying it, it creates the opportunity for people to start giving God their scraps and thinking that they're giving Him a blessing. And that's, that's why we don't do it. Because at the end of the day, you're going to, okay, here's a five rand for you and a two rand for you. And like, God doesn't want that. He wants your first and your best. Not because that's what he wants, because that's what he deserves. In any case, are we willing in our own life to give God everything? Or do we constantly only want to give him what we don't really want? Like, God, you can, you can have my holiday in Joburg CBD. That is fine. But by the way, I still want my Seychelles. That, that, that's how we think. Or is that just me? I don't have either, so I can make that illustration. But let's carry on. Because what we see happen after this happens, Saul or Samuel arrives to Samuel, 
Samuel arrives with, to Saul and he starts telling him, like, what did you do? Like, God gave you one job, kill everything. It's a simple job. He didn't be specific, save this and that. He said, just destroy everything. And then at one stage, Samuel says something that I think is so utterly beautiful. It's horrible, but it's beautiful. It says, but Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? So very often we have this picture of the Lord just wants my sacrifices. He wants me to suffer. No, the Lord wants your obedience. Carries on. Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than an offering of the fat rams. And then just listen to verse 23. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft. Saying, well, thankfully I'm not rebellious. But we are. And then this, and stubbornness as bad as worshipping idols. The amount of Christians that I have spoken to and felt like being that person at times where I said, no, but I'm a stubborn person. Okay? According to God, that is as bad as worshipping idols. Saying, Johan, but maybe that's taken out of context. No, because that's what stubbornness is. Stubbornness and ak is ak is and an old dog and new tricks and all those things. Stubbornness at its heart is I am worshipping my ideas more than God. I know better. So then I become the idol. That's, that's what stubbornness is from God's view. And it's so easy for us to look at this. Like, Yo, like I am who I am. Like You were who you were. And then Jesus. And now he wants to make us new. And he wants to enable you to do it if we accept it. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And then Saul admitted to Samuel, yes, I have sinned. I've disobeyed your instructions and the Lord's command. And then here comes his true heart. For I was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. The problem is, this was all based on a lie. Because every time Saul said anything, if you read that chapter for yourself, the people's response was, if that's what you want, then that's what we do. They were following him blindly. But yet he was scared of them. And so very often we have this precept in our mind, like, Lord, I can't do that because what will happen? And the Lord's like, I went ahead of you. They will follow you. They will be there for you. We just need to be true to what the Lord is calling us to. And then, Saul admitted that he was scared of what the people might have said. And despite the fact that this is what happened, he kept on saying the following. I'm going to carry on in 1 Samuel 15 verse 30, because I want you to understand a bit more of his thinking. Then Saul pleaded again, I know I have sinned, but please at least honor me before the elders. Once again, he's fixating more on the people than he is on God. And before Israel, by coming back with me, just walk with me so that I won't be embarrassed. So that I might worship the Lord, your God. That's the problem. That's the core problem above everything else. Saul never understood God as his God. He worshipped him, and we see that at times he does worship him. And it says, worship your God. And then verse 31, so Samuel finally agreed and went back with him, and Saul worshipped the Lord. Some of us worship the Lord when we go to church on Sundays. We worship him when we drive our cars and we listen to worship music. But when do we make the transition to making your God my God? Because we worship him as a God, but he's not the God. Because very often we... we we are stubborn as like, this is who I am. Creates that we are our own gods. And if we don't understand that personal relationship with God is so important, then we're missing the point. God loves us with everything. And once again, I want to clarify, when, when God tells us to remove something from our life, it isn't because he's trying to remove something. It's because he's trying to give us something. He's not saying, stop sleeping with 20 women. He's trying to give you a happy marriage. He's not saying stop your alcohol abuse. He's saying in sobriety, you'll understand what true happiness is. He's saying if you stop stealing, you won't have to go to jail. So he, he's saying choose a happy marriage. 
choose true joy. He's saying choose not being in jail, which I, I, it's not difficult. Like if you don't go out till three o'clock in the morning, you won't necessarily be in pub fights or whatever. The, your chances of being in an in a after midnight pub fight reduces dramatically if you don't excessively drink. Just common sense. And I'm not judging those people who do that. We've all been late out at night for whatever reason, whether it be whatever. What I'm trying to say is when the Lord tells us to remove something from our life, very often we get fixated on the thing that we're losing and not on the thing that we're gaining. And if we start doing that, life becomes a lot more clear. And then what after happened then, this is just important for later on, after Samuel gave Saul the speech, he literally took a sword. He said, give me your sword if I remember correctly. And he chopped up the foreign king to say, listen, I'm going to finish the job that you couldn't. And I just see this picture of the Lord sending someone else for the thing that he sent us to. And by the way, it also showed that Samuel was serious. But at the core of Saul's story is the refusal to accept the new life God wanted for him. And I want us to, to just look at Saul's story up to this point. Because God made him king and he didn't share the news with his uncle. For those of you who can remember, just bear with me. If you can't remember, just believe me and then you can read it afterwards. At one point, Samuel told Saul, you are going to be the king. And he anointed him or he, he told him you were going to be the new king. And then he went home and he told his uncle or his father, listen, that guy helped us find the donkeys and he didn't tell him about the kingship. Which is fair enough. Maybe he was a bit hesitant. Maybe that's not a thing that we should say, especially since we don't have a king and we've never had one. So maybe you're going to sound a bit crazy. So maybe keep that for yourself. I can get that. But then he was crowned king. He was made king, but where was he? He was hiding in the luggage. It's like he, he was so scared. Like he, he didn't want to accept this new responsibility. And then after being crowned king, we find him plowing the fields, doing his old habits. He wasn't taking up the responsibility. Once again, I'm not throwing him under the bus. We'll see now. We're throwing ourselves under the bus. And when asked to wait for Samuel to make the offering, he got scared and he started listening to people and he started looking at everything around him and saying, but listen, things look bad. And that's when he took matters into his own hand and acted outside of his role. And then the moment Jonathan started looking, his own son started looking like the savior general who stepped up to the game and listened to God, suddenly now he wants to start making decisions. And that's when he started just saying, listen, I'm taking charge, no one eats. Which, by the way, I'm not a general, I don't know much about fighting, but if you're on an empty stomach and you're doing that type of thing, it's not a good choice. Jumps to the completely opposite side and he starts becoming a bull in a china shop. And his true heart's coming to light to the point where he says, um, God is your God and he's willing to sacrifice his son, but he's also not really to, ready to do it. And he not only builds an, uh, an, an altar to the Lord, but he also builds one for himself, as we see in that chapter. There's so much going on in this space and it's so easy to look at Saul and say, you're a hypocrite, you, you're a horrible person. How can the Lord deal with you? But then I think we need to start looking at ourselves. How many times does the Lord tell us to do something and yet we say, no, but I am who I am. And the Lord's like, no, I came to make you new. That's, that's why I came. We say things like, I don't want to finish this or reach this next level of something because I'm busy with something. The Lord wants, the Lord wants you to do something, but you first want to finish stuff at your house. Guilty. The Lord tells you to prepare for for me, for Sunday, but I just quickly want to do this. And every now and again, I need to pull myself back and say, listen, the Lord doesn't care about my deck as much as he cares about the spiritual maturity of the church. Like things like that, where we need to pull ourselves away from our own personal pet projects. We say things like, we shouldn't live to the extreme. That's not really what the Bible means. But sometimes that is what the Bible means. When the Lord says, die to self, it means that we need to put God first and ourselves last. But I think one of the major things is we get discouraged when we fail. If there's one thing that I love about my one-year-old daughter is when she falls, she gets up. It's not a question anymore like, will I get up or will I not? She just gets up because she realizes this is part for the course. 
But yet we as Christians, when we fail, we think, oh, that's it, and we stay down. We need to be reminded that it takes time. Now, the reason I didn't want to read that whole chapter, despite the fact that we already gave it so much airtime, is because I look, feel that the Lord wants to take us from a, set, from a soul type of mindset. Because that's where we all are to some degree, myself included. And he wants to transition us to a David type mindset. Now, how do we do that? Because all of us at this stage are feeling a little bit depressed. But the Lord wants to take us to something new. And this is why I'm praying this morning and since last night and the whole week, like, Lord, just help us hear this. Please allow the Lord to speak to you this morning and not me, the Lord. Because I feel that the Lord wants to take us to a David type people. Now in Samuel 16, or 1 Samuel 16, we see, Now the Lord said to Samuel, You have mourned long enough for Saul. I want to pause there for a moment and I want to tell us, we have mourned long enough for our old lives. We have mourned long enough for our old habits, for our old identities. And I say this in love because I care, but I also don't care what happened to your past with your parents, with your uncles, with your spouses, with your children, all these things that have plagued us and created identities in ourselves. Because we do that and we find our identity in what we did and what other people did and what they did to us and what they said to us. I was just reminded in this week how, how messed up we are as people. The amount of people that I've spoken to, they've got daddy issues and mommy issues and uncle issues and it's, it's horrible. But the Lord is telling us, how long will we mourn? Stop it. Yes, that happened. So it happened. And he's telling Samuel, move on. And I feel that's where we are this morning. I have rejected him as king if we carry on. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel asked, and here we see Samuel's flesh side kicking in, his humanity. How can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Which is a valid point, because he is currently a bull in a china shop. Like, he is the king, and now God is sending you to anoint a new king. And we do that sometimes when the Lord tells us, go and speak to that person. Go share something with them. And the Lord is just saying, like, I don't care about the consequences, just go. What, no, but how will they respond? How will they feel as we've spoken about a lot in this week? That's not the point. The point is go and do it. If the Lord tells us to forgive someone, no, but Lord, he doesn't deserve it. I don't care. Forgive him for your sake and his. I'm not saying it's right, but do it. If the Lord says move as he did to us when he moved to Bathurst, no, but Lord, what about, I don't care, just move. But what we do is we start thinking about what about the consequences? As I mentioned last week, the Lord has consequences, like life is consequences. If I make a choice, good or bad, I've, I, I experience the consequences. But what we forget is when the Lord lays something on our hearts, we should stop worrying about the consequences because he's leading you to something that he already knows. Something that is beautiful, something that is stronger. So stop worrying about what will be the end result because he is the end result if we follow him correctly. In any case, moving on a bit. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice in verse 3, and I will show him, oh, so he tells him, but he will kill me. Sorry, back to verse 2. Take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord, which is fully the truth, just not why he's making the sacrifice. That's on a need-to-know basis only. Verse 3. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you which of his sons you will anoint for me. And what I love about this is because it reminds us that sometimes the Lord tells you what to do or how to start it, but he doesn't tell you how to finish it. Like, just, just do what you're doing. Like, take step one, step out in faith, and I'll tell you the rest when we get there. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived in Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong, they asked. Did you come, do you come in peace? Which I can sort of understand because the last time Samuel made an appearance, he chopped the guy in half. Like You sort of see like Samuel's not in a good space. So when he arrives in the town, the elders of the village 
or the or the area of Bethlehem say do you come in peace or do we need like I just I'm just checking like we good and he's like yes Samuel replied I've come to sacrifice to the Lord purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice and Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. So now you have the elders of the church or the elders of the village of Bethlehem or whatever being invited to the sacrifice. This is a very, very special event. They are being purified. Everyone's got their Sunday, the Alakark Skuna on. Everyone's looking beautiful. Everyone's washed. It's not like today when people washed back then, they meant it because, like, you any stain, stuff stinks. So, like, like th th this is serious. Like, people are clean. Everyone's there. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at, uh, sorry, um, and his sons invited them to the sacrifice too. And when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. Grootste, oudste, best. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by the don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We need to understand that. But for some reason, we as people, we're so fixated on making sure that everything looks right. That's, that's our main concern with everything. Oh, we need to paint the house. We need to dress nicely. We can't tell people we're fighting or that we're emotional or that we're feeling sad because what will they think? We try and block these outward appearances so much and the Lord's just like, stop it. I look at the heart. But now the problem is we as people, we're, we're, we're clever. So now we look at this verse we, we, because we're clever. We say, I can do whatever I want because the Lord knows my heart. And people use this to sin. People use this so that they can do whatever they want. We think about this when we think about non-believers, people who, who don't know about Jesus. No, but the Lord knows their hearts. Well, let's look at what the book of Romans says. So the book of Romans chapter 1 has a lot to say about this, and then we get a bit more specific. For time, I'm just using these two verses as an example, but please feel free to read it in chapters 1, 2, and 3 more specifically. Verse 14 of chapter 2. Even the Gentiles who do not have God's law or written law show that they know His law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience, and their thoughts either accuse them or tell them that they are doing right. Whether you're a believer or non-believer, we all know what is right and wrong. But as we see in chapter 1, where he speaks about how the Lord is evident when we look at nature, when we look around us, when we look at our bodies, the Lord's presence is evident. <laughs> but we choose to ignore it. And if we choose to ignore it long enough, then the Lord's like, okay, if that's your choice, then that's your choice. But all of us, whether we're believers or not, have this instinctive conscience inside of us. So when the Lord says He looks at your heart, that's not what He means. He, he does know that you're deceiving yourself. Then Jesse told his sons, or told his son Abinibad, to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. And I can just see this. Well, the oldest, which we were all expecting, isn't going to be the first. So I can just see the second in charge. Like, he's like walking like a peacock, like that, um, what's that, white chicken from Looney Tunes or something. I say, I say, like Nando's chicken. He, he's strutting his stuff. Because, like, <coughs> if it's not him, then it must be me. That's how they work. Like, that's it. And then you hear Samuel saying, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. Ah! Then Jesse summoned Shemia. But Samuel said, neither is he the one the Lord has chosen. And I can just see number three, number four, number five, number six. And every time they're thinking like, it's going to be me. And then number seven rocks up. It's also not him. None of these are chosen, any of these. Then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? And then Jesse says, there is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and the goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said, 
We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. I love how Samuel doesn't question whether he heard the Lord correctly or whether or is the Lord right or not. He immediately says, the problem must be here because I know I heard him. That's how you know this person can hear the Lord beautifully. Like, this person, here's my sons. He's like, no, something's wrong. And it can't be with what I heard from the Lord. You're the problem. And there's something beautiful about how he knows when he hears the Lord, he knows it. But now picture this. Imagine all the elders, the most important people in the village or wherever you are, everyone that's high and mighty, gathered, they're clean, they're washed. I say again, everyone is in their Sunday best. And then they go send for David. He's not clean, he's dirty, maybe they washed him. I don't know, but because they said, we will not eat until he arrives, I see him coming from the fields, not really showing what's going on because this sort of happened unexpected, probably barefoot or something, dirty, young, like not pitching in, and then realizing, number one, he's feeling awkward because everyone looks at him funny because he's the only one not clean. Secondly, why wasn't I invited? If you think you have daddy issues, when the prophet tells you bring all your sons and you're the one guy left out in the fields, I seriously want to stress this. You need to realize that even your own father did not think you worthy enough to even invite you to this thing. We need to realize what was going probably on in David's head. We need to see that by human standards, he was not qualified. Maybe in that moment he was thinking to himself, well, even me. Maybe in that field he was thinking, Lord, like I just wish someone would see me. Some of us have thought that. Like, Lord, see my rock, please. But what we keep on doing is we try and prove ourselves to other people so that they can see us. And what I feel that the Lord is trying to say is like, stop, stop it. Stop it, Ned. I see your heart. Each and every single one of us here, he sees our hearts. And he has a special purpose for us. Even if it means he needs to go and get you in the field where everyone is there. He won't miss you. But we keep on thinking, and this is just, maybe I'm just useless. But there's been times in my life where I thought, if, I, if I'm just here, then at least God won't miss me. And it's not because I want position. Just, just don't miss me. And the Lord's saying, like, listen, I'll go get you in the field, clean or dirty. Like, I'll go, I'll go and get you. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome because he was in the sun the whole time. With beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one. Anoint him. So David stood there among his brothers. Samuel took a flask of olive oil that he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. I can see this fayokant. I need, we need, to, it's not this beautiful, and those willy worms, this, this horrible, but yet the Lord's Spirit was on him. Sometimes the Lord works in a way that you do not expect. And all that David had to do to be raised up by God was to lose himself for the Lord. What we'll see later on, and I don't want to sort of give a spoiler alert, but there's something that we need to realize, and the difference between Samuel and, Do and David. Anything that David does or sees, whether it be his sin or the giant or anything else, he views it from the Lord's perspective. Samuel sometimes, and even Saul, keeps on looking at the things from worldly perspectives. And that's why we're missed. God, God is calling us to be godly at heart, and not just by outward appearance. In order to do this, we are called to care about what it is that He cares about, and to think about people the way that He thinks about. We need to find our worth and our destiny in Him, and not in ourselves. Because each and every one of us here has a special and unique gifting and calling 
in God's kingdom. But sometimes for our need for affirmation and our need for that, for that injury that happened with your nephew or your uncle or your whatever happened in your life, because we all have bad stories. The more I've been in this role, the more I've spoken to people, the more I've realized like, yes, people have done bad things and people have been missed and realizing how short I've fallen. People go through stuff, but the Lord is saying, like, stop worrying about those things for now. Like, he's sorry that it happened, but now take on this new identity. Because what often happens is each one has this unique gift, but we sideline ourselves because it's not comfortable or because we don't think that we're good enough. And we put on the sort of soul helmets thinking, well, I'm going to hide in the luggage. or I'm going to go back to my old default behaviors in plowing the fields. I'm doing all these things. And then eventually you say, okay, fine, I'll do it. And then you're just reckless because you're not seeking the Lord in anything you do. We sometimes do this. We, we have this, this tug of war, this tension the whole time. Like, okay, Lord, I don't want to do it because I don't think I'm worthy. And then when you do, you just sort of bulldoze ahead. We've all had various issues like that. Maybe we don't want to step out of our comfort zones because this is what we know. But I feel the reason for it is because we don't understand that the Lord truly loves us. He died so that we could have a full life, not so that we can have a comfortable life at our home with our spouses and everything is just good. He came so that we could have a purposeful life. But we try to create our own platforms to convince everyone to fill that need inside of us and that's not what the Lord has called us to. I feel what the Lord is calling us into is to be David, is to realize, that's it. All we need to do today, really, I feel what the Lord is calling us to, is realize that, realize that He sees you, realize that He cares, and He died for each and every single one of us. Like, there's nothing more He can do. There comes a point in time where we need to start accepting it and then start stepping into this new life, which means for some of us, Actually being that radical Christian guy that I don't want to be or taking up a responsibility that I don't necessarily want to or stepping out of our comfort zones and go speaking to people. Some of us need to forgive our fathers or our uncles or our nephews or our mothers or whatever. Because in doing that, we clear our hearts. And when we have clear hearts, the Lord can use us. I heard this week as I close, so many of us have thought and prayed to ourselves, Lord, please use me. And the guy's response was, so make yourself usable. And I thought, that's so beautiful. Because sometimes we pray to the Lord for work, but we don't have a CV. We want the Lord to use us while we're still dirty. And even in his dirt, he was still anointed. Now he needs to go and wash. So that's really what I feel the Lord is calling us to. Accept this new life. Accept what it means to be a Christian. And what that means is you're saved, but now you can overcome sin because He empowers you. Stop saying I'm addicted to something because you're not, because the Holy Spirit is empowering you to get across it. He's not saying that you can forgive that person. You can move. You can do the thing. That's what He's calling us to. Let's be motivated by this and not discouraged. Let's close our eyes. Dear Lord, I want to say thank you for this word, Lord. Lord, I, I pray that you help us be the, your people, Lord. Help us step away from our old default soul type thinking, Lord, where we just default back to our own behaviors, where we don't want to accept what it is that you want us to take on, Lord, and realize that you actually love us, Lord. I pray that you help us accept your love and your purpose, Lord. Help us see that you see us, Lord, that we don't need to try and make people love us, Lord. We don't need to try and tell people what it is that we do, Lord. We don't need to try and just do something, Lord, but we, just, we can just be and you'll go get us in the field, Lord, because that's where you see us, Lord. Thank you for seeing us, Lord. Thank you for loving us, Lord, despite the fact that we don't deserve it, Lord. I pray that you work in us and encourage us as a body, Lord. Help us share this word, Lord. Help us share it with encouragement, Lord. Please. Amen.